Hanna-Barbera. Who doesn't know about them? But for the seven of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, allow me to explain what exactly a Hanna-Barbera is. So Hanna-Barbera Productions was a famous animation studio who were among one of the first animation studios to specialize in making cartoons specifically for television. You may recognize some of their work such as Scooby-Doo, The Flintstones, Yogi Bear, The Jetsons, and many more. But today, I'll only be talking about four video games released for the NES that are based on Hanna-Barbera shows. So in the early 90s, two Japanese video game companies thought that these Hanna-Barbera properties were good enough to warrant making video games about them. And honestly, it kinda makes sense in a way. Because like I said before, a lot of these shows are very recognizable by many generations. Also, as a side note, I will not be talking about that one Tom and Jerry game on the NES. I understand that Bill, Hannah, and Joe Barbera created Tom and Jerry, but for the sake of this review, I think talking about four games is good enough. I also think Tom and Jerry games would also work as its own separate video in the future. But anyways, in 1991, we would get our first video game based on a Hanna-Barbera property released for the NES with our first game being The Flintstones, The Rescue of Dino and Hoppy. So I'm sure this specific Flintstones game is familiar to those who watch Vine Sauce or are familiar with bootleg video games because this specific Flintstones game is more well known as the bootleg game titled Seven Granddad. Flintstones? Just thought I'd bring that up. So the Flintstones rescue of Dino and Hoppy begins with the Flintstones and the Rubbles enjoying their lives in bedrock. That is until a mysterious man from the 30th century named Dr. Butler who I swear looks almost exactly like Adolf Hitler, or at least the version from Captain Planet, just without the mustache. But anyways, Dr. Butler kidnaps Dino and Hoppy while also destroying the Great Gazoo's time machine and scattering the pieces. So that means it's up to Fred to find the pieces to the Great Gazoo's time machine and rescue Dino and Hoppy, as the title implies. So in the game, you take control of Fred Flintstone, who carries around a giant club as a weapon to attack dinosaurs and other cavemen, who for some reason really want Fred Flintstone dead. You're able to hold B, which allows you to do a charge attack. This could be useful at times because it allows you to easily defeat specific enemies. In this game, you're able to grab onto edges and climb up. It could get some time to get used to, but you'll eventually get the hang of it. You're also able to climb down, which is definitely a lot better than taking a leap of faith, or possibly falling to your death, or getting hit by an enemy. Thankfully the game is very generous, because the game gives you unlimited continues. So in each level you can find these barrels you can open by simply hitting it. These barrels will either replenish your health or give you an item, like this hammer for example, which can be very useful to defeat enemies as well as defeating the boss of level 1. So like many other NES games, the level ends with you fighting a boss. And the thing you must know about these boss fights is that never use your club to fight. Always, and I repeat, always use the selectable weapons to fight the bosses is very helpful. Also keep in mind that you lose these weapons every time you die. So anyways, after you defeat a boss in each respective level, you get a piece of the Great Kazoo's time machine, and you're allowed to proceed to the next level via the Super Mario Bros. 3-like minimap. But before moving on to the next level, you're given the option to play this basketball minigame. And just like real life basketball, I'm absolutely terrible at it. As far as I know, if you win the game of basketball, it allows you to call upon the Great Kazoo to give you a hand. A few complaints I have with this game is that the controls feel a little slippery. Another complaint I have is that getting hit results in you flying a million miles backwards like Castlevania and Ninja Gaiden. This could be super annoying, especially in the auto-scrolling section in level 2, which resulted in me having to replay that section of level 2 over and over again. The last complaint I have with this game is the damn ice level, because apparently all games need ice levels apparently. It doesn't help that it takes forever to come to a complete stop which results in you getting hit by an enemy or falling down a pit. But besides all those issues I have, it's generally a pretty good game. I'd say it's enjoyable and maybe you should give it a try one day. Also, not sure if you noticed this but on the title screen, there's an all rights reserved notice for 
The Jetsons. That's because at the end of the game, George Jetson shows up, which implies that this game is canon to both shows, as well as the Jetsons meet the Flintstones. Also, why is Wilma's dress black? So, wacky races. While not being one of Hanna-Barbera's biggest household names when compared to Scooby-Doo and the Flintstones, it does have its fans and is well liked. But I'm sure all of you are wondering as to why Wacky Races out of all the Hanna-Barbera shows would get a video game released in the early 1990s. Well you see, in Japan, Wacky Races or Chiki Chiki Mashin Mao Race is extremely popular over there and is still the most beloved and famous Hanna-Barbera show in Japan, aside from like Tom and Jerry. That's honestly quite an accomplishment, considering that there really aren't that much pieces of foreign media that are well known and popular in Japan. So now it definitely makes sense as to why Wacky Races got a video game instead of Magilla Gorilla. Another thing you might find interesting about this game is that Taito isn't the developer or publisher of this game, which might explain as to why there's no Hanna-Barbera Superstars branding on the title screen. The developers and publishers of this game is none other than Atlas. Yes, that Atlas. The same company who developed many classics like Friday the 13th and The Karate Kid for the NES. Oh, they also made these obscure titles not many people know about. So when you start the game, you see all the racers driving by the title screen, which for some reason really reminds me of Super Mario Kart. Here's a fun fact. Did you know? The title theme to this game is actually an 8-bit rendition of the Japanese theme song to the Wacky Races. This honestly makes me wonder what the American Speed Racer theme song would sound like if Speed Racer had a video game on the NES. Once you start the game, you're immediately dropped into a mini-map which gives you three areas to choose in whatever order you want. Each area has its own separate story but is relatively the same for all, with it involving something happening to Dick Dastardly and Muttley needing to rescue him. Although Splish Splash involves Muttley needing to find a new engine for the Mean Machine. So once you begin a level, you'll be surprised that Wacky Races on the NES is not actually a racing game. It's a platformer. Shocker I know, right? So in this game, you play as Muttley the dog, who has an unlimited supply of bombs and other attacks. You're able to select these weapons by simply pressing the select button. Although, you need to grab a dog bone just to be able to select an attack like a loud bark, this glide ability, bombs, and extra health with a max of 6 health bars. With an unlimited supply of bombs, this makes Muttley one of the most unstoppable hounds in the world, as well as one you would never want to mess with. The glide ability can be useful at times like easily getting over enemies as well as getting across long gaps and making this bouncy snow area less annoying. A complaint I have with this game is that the enemies feel really generic and don't really feel like wacky races characters. So at the end of each level, you fight a racer from the show who all have something against Muttley. The first boss of World 1 is the Gruesome Twosome, and hot damn can these bosses kick my ass. I ended up losing and getting a few game overs, but thankfully, there's checkpoints in each level. And even if you get a game over, you spawn at the last checkpoint instead of having to start over from the beginning of the stage. So I mentioned earlier that you can freely choose whichever world you want to go to, which is what I decided to do in order to check the other areas of the game. The levels I played were all generally pretty easy, with a bit of challenge to make them not too easy. My main complaint about this game would be that this doesn't really feel like a wacky races game. Like Blues Brothers, this feels like Atlas was developing their own original game, but decided they get the Wacky Races license. So all they did was replace the original characters and swap them out for Wacky Races characters. In case you somehow didn't know, the game itself is really short, with there only being 3 worlds and 3 levels in each. 
so in the end, I think this game is just kinda alright. It's not bad or anything, but it's no masterpiece either, and it's definitely an interesting part of Atlas's history, and one I suggest you give a try. Also, you will never get an original copy of this game, well, unless you're like super rich or some shit. We now reach another game based on one of Hanna-Barbera's most recognizable shows, The Jetsons. While initially only being a modest success and only lasting for one season, the show would eventually gain a strong cult following from reruns airing in syndication for over 20 years. With the show being revived and getting two more seasons as well as getting a theatrical movie released in 1990. Two years after the movie came out, this game would come out for the NES in late 1992, with Natsume developing the game and Taito publishing. When you start the game and wait a little while on the title screen, you'll be greeted with an 8-bit rendition of the Jetsons theme song. While the song plays, you see a nice intro of George Jetson flying around, with a list of Jetsons characters appearing at the bottom of the screen. So the game's plot is relatively simple in a way. Basically, the plot revolves around Mr. Spacely telling George to put a stop to Mr. Cogswell's schemes. So that means it's up to George to hop from level to level to put a stop to Cogswell. I do kind of find it strange that Mr. Spacely sends George of all people to stop Cogswell instead of like law enforcement or something. But whatever, it's an old video game after all. So the Jetsons for NES consists of 12 levels with you taking control of George. He's able to pick up crates and throw them at enemies, which totally doesn't remind me of another licensed game on the NES based on a popular cartoon. But anyways, these crates are your only form of attack against these evil robots who work for Mr. Cogswell. These crates you can pick up can contain stars, Dr. Mario pills, and health bars. There's also these switches you can pull down which can open doors, make platforms rise and stop, and could even temporarily change the gravity, which can allow you to walk on the ceiling similar to Mega Man 5. I do kind of find it satisfying to pick up and throw a batch of crates and feel rewarded to find items like a health bar and a 1-up. However, an enemy could be hiding in the crates, which can act as a surprise and increase the difficulty by just a bit, if you're not careful like me. Like many other games, you face off against a boss fight at the end of each level. Level 1's boss fight is this robotic dog that I swear felt so difficult the first time I played this game. It's primarily due to one side being a conveyor belt, which can make you fall off if you're not careful, so that means you definitely shouldn't pick up crates that are near the edge. At times, I couldn't even hit this robotic dog, since the crates would either miss or hit a smaller robotic dog. The robotic dog itself stays on a platform for a short period of time before jumping off to another platform. After several attempts, I was able to defeat the enemy and move on to the next level. It's set in this forest-like garden with bugs that'll charge towards you, as well as these small dinky flowers that could be a massive pain in the ass to jump on and off. A few complaints I have with this game would be that George's jumps feel very short and awkward, especially during those damn jumps in the second level. Another complaint would be that the controls itself can feel very slippery, especially while running, or more specifically, walking because George is very slow in this game, kinda like Fred in the Flintstones game. But besides all those complaints, I do appreciate how colorful and vibrant the game is for the NES and it really does feel like a Jetsons game. So in general, the game does have its flaws, but could be a pretty fun and enjoyable game like the other Hanna-Barbera games. And like Wacky Races, you will never get an original copy of this game. Well, unless you're like super rich or some shit. We now reach our fourth and final game in this lineup of games. And it happens to be our only sequel, as well as the only Hanna-Barbera game on the NES to never get a Famicom release in Japan. This is due to the game releasing so extremely late in the lifespan of the NES. So like many other late release Taito games for the NES, this game's value has skyrocketed at being worth hundreds if not thousands of dollars just for an original copy of this game. Another factor to this game's rarity is primarily due to the game supposedly being an exclusive to Blockbuster, at least here in North America. The European version is a little less expensive, but it's still rare. You know, this kind of reminds me of DuckTales 2 and Chip and Dale 2, because those two games were also released extremely late in the NES's lifespan, as well as those two also being relatively rare and valuable. 
Alright, I think that's enough time talking about rare and valuable video games. So let's see how the Flintstone Surprise of Dinosaur Peak holds up today, and if it's really worth spending this much money on an original copy of the game. The Flintstone Surprise of Dinosaur Peak starts off with Fred and Barney both looking for Pebbles and Bam Bam, as it appears they went missing, so the two eventually go looking for their kids. Now graphically, the game looks the exact same as the original Flintstones game. That's not a bad thing, since there's a good amount of games on the NES that look very similar to their predecessors. Now what makes this game unique from its predecessor is that you can play as either Fred or Barney, with you being able to switch between characters by simply pressing the select button. The two characters have a good amount of differences. Fred uses a club as his weapon which can easily kill an average enemy with just one hit, while Barney uses a slingshot that takes around two hits to kill an enemy. Fred is the only one who can climb and hold onto an edge, like the first game, while Barney can only climb and slide on these poles. You can also stand on these poles for a very limited amount of time. The two even have weight differences, as Fred is obviously a lot heavier, while Barney is more light in weight, which means that Barney can be thrown in the air much higher than Fred. At the end of level 1, you finally find Pebbles and Bam Bam, but a volcano erupts which prevents Fred and Barney from getting their kids back. The Great Gazoo eventually shows up and tells Fred that there's absolutely no way for him to help the two kids, so he tells Fred and Barney that they have to talk to a fire dinosaur to get help and save Pebbles and Bam Bam, and hope that the two don't get burned by lava. So yeah, the plot itself is very simple and is right to the point, with Fred and Barney just trying to get their kids back. You venture through various locations like a jungle with monkeys and this armadillo that kicks my ass. In this level, you can find this bird that'll take you up to the skies, which acts as the bonus level. In this bonus level, you collect falling stars that'll fill up a letter at the bottom left corner. And once you spell out Yabba Dabba Do, the game gives you an extra life. While I do appreciate the extra lives, the game still gives you unlimited continues, which is something I appreciate because a few parts in this game really kicked my ass like the minecart area in level 3, the armadillo I mentioned earlier, and there's one part in the second area of the surfing level. Like the first game, this game features these sports minigames that show you how much I absolutely suck at playing sports in video games. The game itself is generally pretty short, because it could be beaten in around an hour or less, and the bosses themselves can be pretty easy at times, but besides those minor complaints, I do think that this game looks great. I mean seriously, despite looking extremely similar to the first game, the game still looks extremely colorful and beautiful, since it shows you that many late release games on the NES took advantage of the hardware, cause look at the detail of that boulder in level 1. I like that boulder. That is a nice boulder. So anyways, yeah, the game is really good, and while it may take some time to get used to control wise, you'll find yourself really enjoying and appreciating Taito's swan song for the NES. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that all of these games were generally pretty enjoyable and weren't bad at all. Sure, they may have a few minor flaws, but I'd say they're all worth your time checking out on an emulator, cause you sure as hell ain't buying these games with prices like these. Also there was one last thing I forgot to include while writing the script. The music in these games are really good. Like absolutely good, like they're so good that I would listen to them every now and then, or maybe include them as background music in my videos. But in general, they're all really enjoyable and decent late release games for the NES that do capture the spirit of the cartoons they're based on. Since there's a lot more systems out there and more Hanna-Barbera shows, I'll probably take a look at other Hanna-Barbera games released for different systems like the Super Nintendo, Game Boy, and Sega Genesis another day. But for now, I have some things to do. So I guess I'll catch you folks another time.